So I'd like to um, welcome our residents who joined just 10 days ago when the residency started. They're joining from New York, from DC, um, from Turkey. We have with us Jessica Martin. Hello, Jessica, Franklin Chu, Munjer, Alison Silva, Munjer Hashim, Alison Silva, and Renan Tauman. Welcome everyone. Now, of course, Anthony, it's a great pleasure to see you again. Anthony has been involved with T-Space Residency as a critic um, in the past, and I'm glad to welcome you back. Anthony is an artist and an architect, an educator with training both in art and architecture. He's the founder of Anthony Titus Studio and his practice merges art and architecture. His work has, he has broadly written and exhibited uh, work on the subject of the merging of the two disciplines, and he is currently an assistant professor of architecture at Rensselaer. Um, the subject of the title, rather, of uh, your presentation is Head in the Sky, Eyes to the Ground. I would like to uh, pass it on to you right away, Anthony. Briefly, we're anticipating approximately a 45-minute presentation, followed by questions and answers. Uh, and a general discussion from our panelists and our audience. For those of you who are new to Zoom webinar, there is a Q&A um, button at the bottom of your screen that you can use. Feel free to use it throughout the lecture, no need to wait uh, for the end. And you can also use the chat uh, function uh, if there are any questions throughout uh, the lecture. So welcome everybody, thank you. Thank you so much, Irini. Uh, I, it is a great uh, pleasure and honor to be here this morning. Uh, yes, I've had the uh, pleasure of being at T-Space and I was lucky enough to be there last summer and I lectured there. So I had the chance to see uh, the site and the archive, which I believe was just about complete uh, last July, I believe, right. late July. So. Uh, I certainly look forward to being back, and I want to thank everyone uh, for joining this morning. Uh, I, as, as all, I'm sure we're all in a kind of interesting time warp and time loop. I mean, normally we would never be <laughs> lecturing or going to a lecture at 11 a.m. in the morning unless we were teaching class or attending class. So uh, I find this to be a kind of wonderful uh, luxury and a, a, just a beautiful thing to wake up to do. So. I really appreciate it. So as has been described, uh, I am an architect, I am an educator and an artist, and I have an affinity to T-Space because it is one of the few precious institutions that we have which really cherishes the co-mingling, the cohabitation of so many of the arts. And we all know we need so many more of those spaces. So I wanna begin by thanking Stephen, of course, Dimitra, Irini, and Celia for helping to orchestrate uh, the total project and helping to bring me here today. So the title of my lecture, Head in the Sky, Eyes to the Ground. As mentioned, I have a, a kind of multidisciplinary practice and it spans roughly 20 years, I would say 2000 and one until, uh, this is 2020, so we're going on 19 years. Uh, I'm based in New York City. I was born in New York City and studied architecture at the Cooper Union and later studied painting for a master's degree in Chicago at the University of Chicago. So with the exception of about 18 months, I've been in New York continuously and I've watched the city change. And it's a really interesting um, landscape in which to watch the way the world has changed over the last 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, almost 50 years. So I'd like to speak today uh, about my practice, but specifically about ideas or influences around my practice. I think painting, which is what I really uh, focus on as an artist, is a medium that really requires uh, an intimate one-to-one -one experience, at least in my view, and obviously that's a very difficult thing to experience or share through a screen. So I think it would almost be um, 
ridiculous in a sense to try and convey the materiality or the or the uh, tactile the tactility of painting through a screen but I'll try to the extent possible but really I'd like to speak about the ideas around my work so I began studying architecture close to 30 years ago and it has been an amazing journey filled with incredible educators, teachers, uh, fellow uh, colleagues, students, and it's just a wonderful, beautiful um, experience in life. And I'm so happy that the love of architecture and art has brought us all here today. Over the course of my studio practice, I've really tried to think very carefully about the way in which painting and sculpture relate to the specific space of architecture. And the majority of my projects thus far have been installations. So in almost every scenario, the actuality of the space, meaning the very particular nature of the architecture has played a critical role in the making of the objects that would inhabit those spaces or the arrangement of the objects in those spaces. I think this question of the neutrality of a box and the autonomy of art is one that I've always tried to think very carefully about. And I've tried to find ways to work in that contradiction and to work around it. So I'd like to just speak about a couple of projects in particular, just to give some insight into these questions of painting, architecture, sculpture, painting, architecture. But I want to start by uh, addressing the question of the architectural residency this year, which I think is a fantastic and wonderful idea. And from what I understand, it's a transformation of consciousness pavilion. And Stephen laid out eight uh, principles or points that were deemed to be important in terms of understanding the relevance and significance of this pavilion. And in preparing this talk, I thought, wow, this is a huge tall order for anyone to think about. And I thought maybe from my vantage point, it would be important maybe to speak most specifically about eight, which is the primacy of creativity and the spiritual optimistic force in all the arts. The title of the talk actually, uh, interestingly enough, came from an essay uh, that I wrote for a book on Stephen's work that was edited by Dr. Christoph A. Kumpusch back in 2014. The title of the book was called Urban Hopes Made in China by Stephen Hull. And it had a number of incredible authors and other architects in the book, including Lovius Woods and Christoph Kumpusch and Ai Weiwei. And I was really um, pleased to write an essay that spoke to this question of dreaming, in a sense, dreaming. And what does it mean to understand architecture or art as something that comes out of a sense of wanting a future to be essentially better, right? To project into the future. So this notion of having the eyes to the ground, right? Is a way of saying, can we look to the moment that we're in Okay, but also imagine a future, which is perhaps where the head in the sky comes from, right? So that we're both in the reality that we understand at the moment, good and bad, but we're looking for a future that is obviously, hopefully, better than the one that we're in right now. So this question of vision and seeing and the role that architecture, art plays in shaping the future is critical. In this intersection of architecture and painting, I try to look very specifically at the spatial element, which I believe is the kind of interface between the two. I see it as the wall. And I think one really powerful relationship that painting and architecture have to one another is the painting sitting on the wall, right? This is the kind of default manner in which painting is presented probably for the last 150 years, right? 
In other words, the extraction of painting from a specific context and laying it on essentially a bare wall is the paradigm that we know. It's a very, very powerful paradigm. But I've often thought there are other alternatives, right? That a painting can engage a wall in a number of ways, right? It can engage it by sitting flat on it. It can float from the wall. It can be embedded in the wall. It can be placed directly on the wall. And there are many other variations of this question. So in really trying to think about this question of painting and architecture, the object in the wall, I've tried to think carefully about including these ideas in a number of exhibitions. This is, these are a couple of images from an exhibition at Cornell University. Um, and it was organized and curated by Dr. Mark Morris. And it was a really interesting opportunity because this particular gallery, if anyone knows the gallery, is somewhere in between a standard white box and a fish tank, right? So it's not the kind of pure hermetically sealed box that we're used to. And it's also not completely open. It's somewhere in between. And I thought it would be a really interesting challenge to try and understand the specifics of this particular architecture, using the walls, using the objects to reveal things about the painting that you normally would not see. For instance, the edge of the painting. Right? Is it possible to treat the edge of the painting as if it is as, as if it were important as the frontal surface of the painting? As we know, the edge is often something that is not considered. The back of the painting is often not considered. I mean, obviously, the painter sees it. Um, a couple of unlucky art movers tend to get to see the back of the painting, or archivists occasionally, lucky or unlucky, depending on <laughs> uh, where you place yourself in that spectrum. But I feel that some of the most interesting aspects of painting are the things that you typically don't pay attention to, the things that you don't want to see, which is the edge, the side, or the back. So thinking carefully about how to bring these questions in proximity, allow a painting perhaps to float from a wall where you actually get a glimpse of the color that might be behind the painting. So this question of bringing attention to the surface of the painting, the shadow, across the surface, bringing attention to the, to the physicality of it, the reality of it, in front of you, you in front of it, and this very, uh, I would say, unmediated condition. I mean, I think one of the most incredible things about painting is that it's probably one of the few creative disciplines that we have that is, is unmediated in a certain way. That is to say, if you're standing in front of a painting, there are exceptions, of course, but most paintings, you see the trace of how that object was made. And in many instances, it's the trace of the painter. Sometimes it's assistance in other people, but in many instances, you're actually seeing the hand, the mind, and the eye of an individual, traces left in space. I think this is something which is so important and so delicate particularly in the moment that we live in, where so much of what we experience is at a distance. And this particular moment, of course, is, is a heightened, <laughs> heightened version of that. But I, I would say this has been something that's important to me. So in looking at this particular space, trying to understand how you might see this space from all of its angles, even from an aerial view, right? Constructing models, constructing maquettes so that there's a sense of how these objects may be orchestrated in space and how you might begin to establish certain visual and optical rhythms that viewers or inhabitants might sense when they're in the space. So the sense of study three-dimensionally is very important. And finding opportunities where you can locate objects, layer objects in space, and using photography as a particular way of capturing vantage points of views that, again, might go unnoticed when one is in the quote unquote three dimensional space, but when photographed and captured, it brings attention to certain, uh, certain relationships that may be very important. The juxtaposing of an object in a wall. Right, something that's between sculpture, something that's between painting, something that's between architecture. I'm very interested in this question and extending these principles to different spaces. This was another exhibition which took place 
at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee shortly after the exhibition in Cornell. And essentially it was the same body of work um, packed up, shipped, uncreated, and reconstituted in a very, very different space. So the challenge was to situate the work in space in such a way that it would respond to this particular gallery. So a series of freestanding podiums, essentially, or totem poles were built, and the paintings were located on those freestanding objects. The walls around were painted and certain paintings were placed on those walls. So again, this notion of transforming a space, bringing work to a place, and allowing them to have a dialogue. And the third iteration of this work, uh, which took place at Friedman Mende Gallery shortly after the exhibition in Milwaukee, um, allowed for the paintings to be concentrated in a single space and in a single room. So I wanted to understand the possibility of organizing these objects in such a way that they would almost be in confrontation to one another. So five or six white relief paintings on one wall and a series of small rectilinear color paintings on the opposite wall. Right. Creating a scenario where you're almost pulled between this tension, right? Something that is relatively blank and quiet on the left and relatively loud on the right. And of course, in the perspectival distance, there is a Dan Flavin uh, sculpture in the next room. So I thought it was also, a, you know, a very beautiful opportunity to be next to a work that was very much about color, very much about light, but about a very different kind of medium, which is that of electricity and energy and power. So in trying to look at this question of origin and where one comes from, I think is, is an interesting question to speak about, particularly in a lecture, because again, I don't think a lecture is about recreating the experience of work. It's perhaps about sharing some images that may approximate an experience, but I really think talks are more interesting when you begin to frame the work around where you think you come from, at least, or who you think you are. And one of the first exhibitions that uh, I had in New York City was an exhibition where I worked on a series of sculptures and paintings and all of the paintings and all of the pieces of sculpture were based upon a series of uh, paintings that were remade uh, paintings. I remade paintings by the, the television painter Bob Ross. I don't want to talk about that too much because it's not so much about Bob Ross, but, but there was something to me very interesting about images of nature being constructed on television from someone's imagination and people being entranced by that, including me as a young 12, 11 year old child watching these things. I mean, they were so soothing. And of course, you know, this is the type of thing that you kind of put out of your mind as you enter college or you enter university because, you know, it's, it certainly doesn't hold up to the canon that you're expected to respond to and talk about and emulate. But the interesting thing about life is that, you know, you're really a product of so many experiences and, and so many of those experiences happen so early in your life, it's very, very difficult to pull yourself away from them unless you work through them. So I thought it would be an interesting challenge to try and construct a series of sculptures, drawings, and paintings, which meditated upon one landscape painting. And what would it mean to introduce wood, stone, metal, screen printing into the process of making, to place sculpture on the floor without pedestals, right? Sculptural paintings on the floor objects that would essentially fold upon themselves or create echoes of, of reflections and shadows upon themselves, inviting the viewers to enter the works, almost 
uh, in a sense, being invited to be a part of the space of these works. And I think the one thing that I have found to be incredibly um, sustaining over, I would now say, decades of studying and teaching and practicing is the act of drawing. I find drawing to be something that is, is so important. It's a way for you to think visually, to think quickly, and to speak in a way that is rather unique and true to oneself. Um, I often find that when you look back at your sketchbooks, whether it's a year ago, 10 years ago, or in some cases, if you're fortunate enough to have a very long career, it could be 50, 60, 70 years ago. I think you tend to find that you're working on one problem <laughs> over and over and over again. And that problem may have different manifestations. It may take different forms, but this sense of how to orchestrate, how to arrange lines, volumes, planes, and to give meaning or significance to how those things are being arranged is one of the most um, mysterious things. And I, I almost see drawing as a form of writing. I often draw in lined notebooks, sometimes leaving notes, sometimes leaving uh, notations, but really many of the images are almost written. And it's a language that I find um, legible to me, but I don't know if it's legible to anyone else, but I always think carefully about what it means to draw. And I, I see drawing as being this, this question of not just putting something down onto something else. In other words, it's not simply putting lines onto paper or lines onto a surface. It's really about pulling something out of something. So if one thinks about drawing water or drawing blood, right, to pull or extract something out of something is how I like to see drawing. So when sketches end up in a sort of um, larger form, so to speak, right, I also try and think carefully about what the presence of a drawing may be when it leaves a sketchbook, right? So in these particular images, right, I'm trying to look carefully at the particular painting and what it might mean to construct a painting through drawing and to suggest that there is a framework in which these might be placed, perhaps bordering on a question of architectural space. Uh, in other words, they're open-ended. And I think that's also very important when one works, that you don't feel as if you ever have the answers fully. I think every project leaves residue, and that residue is very important because it may often help you see a question or a problem that you have many, many, many years or decades down the road. So in that sense, I really do believe in this question of the premonition, right? And how you arrive at something is it's, it's very mysterious. Like no one really knows how or why they ever do anything. I'm convinced of that. But the more you work, the clearer you do become about what you're working on, right? I mean, I think over time you see that there are certain colors, forms, figures, shapes that keep appearing in your work. And I've tried to learn to trust those things and to question them less in terms of their their validity, but question them more in terms of their ability to communicate better. So this question of working through problems is very, very important to me. As I've mentioned, I've been in New York City now for essentially my entire life. I've had the great honor and pleasure of traveling to different parts of the country, different parts of the world, and spending a fairly good amount of time outside of the city in the last, I would say, five or six years. But there is something about the, the energy of New York City that I find undeniable. And 
I've seen the city in so many states of, <laughs> of, uh, of um, this is a PG-14 audience, but let's just say I've seen the city in many different forms, as I'm sure many people have, if you've had the, the, the experience of being here over a significant period of time. And when I was um, very young, New York City was a very different place. Um, this was the mid-1970s into the early 80s and eventually into the early 90s. And New York City was, was um, in a lot of trouble, so to speak. I mean, financially, the city was near bankrupt the year that I was born. And, you know, I have to imagine parents giving birth to a child. I mean, much like now, I mean, now, of course, is, is, is unprecedented. So this is not to compare then to now. But I'm just trying to imagine what it means for a parent to bring children right, or a child into the world, and that world may seem unstable, it may seem unpredictable, yet you go through with that incredible process, right, of, of introducing a child into the world. And we're all introduced into a particular place. And what's very interesting is we really have no control over where we're born, who we're born to, uh, well, unless you're Tom Cruise, but other than that, <laughs> we're all pretty much tossed to the winds of fate. And my fate was Coney Island, uh, which if anyone knows is the very, very Southern tip of Brooklyn. It's probably about as far South as you can get in New York City before you fall off into the Atlantic Ocean. And I always thought it was this really incredible thing even as a child, I understood how strange and unique it was to be living directly across the street from the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the interesting thing is I can barely swim. Okay, my siblings can, so it's, it's, it's just me. But growing up across from that water was, was an amazing experience of formation, perceptually, socially, culturally. And anyone who knows Coney Island, you, you may understand that it, it has a very long, by our historical standards, history. And it was one of the first um, technological leaps in the Northeast, in America, uh, but in the Northeast in particular, and primarily to do with electricity, with lighting, with entertainment. And it was often a place where people came uh, in the very early part of the 19th, uh, 20th century, excuse me, for entertainment, uh, for vacationing. And it was a place that really excited the imagination of many people, many architects, many artists, many of us know those stories. But I got to live in that place. But by the time I was born, it was a very different place. Uh, Coney Island had, had suffered three uh, major fires over its its duration, and by the time I was born, the the third fire had hit. So it was pretty much a place that you did not really go to unless you happened to be from there, or in the summer occasionally uh, people would come from far away. But for the most part, people that that lived there were the people that inhabited that place. And it had a very, very, um, I would say, coarse, coarse texture. Texture. Um, you know, there were a lot of, um, I would say, gangs at the time, street gangs. Um, that might seem relatively innocent by today's standards, but, you know, th it was a very um, um, tense place, like much of New York City. But the difference between, I would say, the rest of New York City and Coney Island was that Coney Island was so far removed from the rest of the city. I mean, it really almost felt like a different city, almost. I wouldn't go so far as to say a different country, but certainly a different city, for sure. But there was this interesting thing that would happen for a couple of months of the year, and you would have this sort of mass congregation of people on the beach. And the thing that was always interesting about living across the street from the ocean, from the beach, is that you would be able to see 
this massive landscape of people. Now, I lived 14 stories above the street. So it was really an incredible view because you have to imagine that that's probably, you know, over 120 feet in the air, not much in front of the building. So really having this incredible panoramic view almost, right, out into the ocean and occasionally seeing a few dots and buildings and so forth, but really seeing a mass tapestry of people on the beach in the summer. And that kind of experience of seeing people so close to the water has always made me think very carefully about how fragile we are as a species, how fragile architecture is. And it really made me think about some of the other questions that Stephen brought up. Uh, which of course has to do with respect for the power of nature. And I think when you live so close to places that are already quite fragile and delicate and coarse, but directly on the, on, on the face of, of, of nature, you're really aware of just how quickly everything you make can just go away. So of course there are the famous fires, but then when Sandy hit uh, about eight years ago, uh, it, completely undermined and destroyed a massive part of that area in a way that, you know, I would say they're still recovering from. Well, when I was there, I grew up in this building, which was actually a very beautiful building designed by these two architects named Hoberman and Wasserman. And they were not very famous architects, but they were very, um, well-respected New York-based architects who were building a number of thoughtful and progressive housing uh, experiments throughout New York City. And there was an entire movement of, of architects working in these progressive ways throughout New York City. You still see traces of some of these buildings. And it was an incredible building to grow up in because it was really carefully considered in terms of the fenestration, uh, how families or individuals would live with one another and live relative to other families. And from our window, by the way, uh, that window with the orange light was our living room window. And from that window, you would see the beach, right, at night. And occasionally, you know, if you had street lights down on the beach or sometimes the moon off to the left in the sky, you would really see this incredible void. And I can't tell you how astounding it was as a child to see constellations. By the time I was 11, I think I kind of learned and remembered all of the constellations, Orion, the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, and it was right there in front of me. So I found it to be a really um, fortunate experience, despite some of the difficulties and limitations of the place due to social conditions and cultural conditions. But being in that apartment was somewhat of a sanctuary. And, you know, I want to come to the question of painting and architecture, and perhaps why I got drawn and pulled into that question. As I said earlier, you know, we often don't know why we bring ourselves or brought to certain things. But I think the parents that you have certainly play a role in that. And when I was, I would say, two years old, my parents were college students at City College. My father was studying architecture and my mother was a painter and she was studying sociology. And I still remember my father's drafting table, how meticulous he was in keeping his lead holders, his triangles, his scale, his T-square. Um, some of the young residents may not know what these things are, but uh, these were the tools that uh, architects, architects used uh, maybe up until 30 years ago in many instances, but he was very meticulous. And I, I, to this day, I remember the trace paper. I remember the white plastic tube container that he purchased from Charette. If anybody remembers, Charette was a, it's a wonderful supply store on 33rd Street and Lexington Avenue. And I think they were in Boston and in a couple of other cities. But I just remember seeing models of his, these, these beautiful models made of, of, of 
uh, chipboard and wood and not knowing what they were per se, because I was very, very young, maybe two years old, three years old, but I, but I remember the care that he took in those objects. And my mother, as I said, was studying sociology and she was a painter. And for some reason, for some reason, there were two paintings, and my older sister confirmed this for me recently. It wasn't just my imagination. There were two paintings that she kept underneath my bed for years. And they were colorful abstractions, red, green, yellow, blue, purple, very simple shapes. And sand was mixed into the paint. And those are two of my earliest memories of what my parents did. And, you know, the interesting thing was, is that my, my dad, you know, one of his um, recurring assignments was to draw the apartment. So these were drawings that he made of the apartment as a first year architecture student at City College. And he uh, had a professor named Professor B, who was, uh, you know, was a very interesting uh, professor and, and my father always respected him and still speaks very highly of him almost 40 some odd years later. And you know the thing that was 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 interesting is I saw these drawings from a very young age and, and that vanishing point, that blue vanishing point was the horizon looking out of the window of the living room. And my parents is that they were quite young at the time. I mean they were they were older than most undergraduate college students. They were in their mid twenties and, and upper twenties, but they were very energetic and they stayed up for all night, typically doing homework, uh, doing schoolwork, having conversations. And I was always up with them <laughs> until two or three in the morning. And my mother would joke, you know, she said, we would have to trick you to make you go to sleep. We would have to pretend as if we were going to bed, turn out the lights, go in the room, and after about a half hour, you would fall asleep. And she said, then you got smarter and you realized it was a trick and you'd come back down. So they always had a chair there for me. So that small chair was my chair. The bigger chair was maybe Papa chair and then the, the smaller one was Mama chair. They were the same size, it's just perspective. But my chair was literally smaller. And I would sit there and just chat their ears off all night long asking them questions about what they did and what's this thing and what's that book and how do you do this? So these are some of my earliest memories. So I think this question of trying to understand a possible relationship between painting and architecture is very, very personal to me in that sense. And perhaps unconsciously, I've tried to recreate those paintings that my mother made, which sadly don't exist anymore. I mean, it's amazing how time uh, you know, has this way of just absorbing things and you, you can't locate things at certain points. So if you have uh, things that you really care for, really care for them because they can go like that sometimes. But I would say one experience that really, really uh, changed my life um, and it happened in that very apartment that we lived in where my parents drew, painted, wrote. It was this very unique moment in about 1985. And actually I remember the date, uh, which I'll save for another lecture. But my mother and I, we were standing in the living room. This was the living room and you can see the horizontal window, which was about 14 feet long. So imagine that was your view to the Atlantic Ocean. And one day, my mother and I, we were standing in the living room. Here's a moment where I can't use the red pointer, but just imagine me on one side of the window and her on the other side of the window. And all I was thinking about really while she was speaking was the Little League baseball game that I was supposed to get ready for that evening. So she was talking to me and as children tend to do, sort of pay attention to what their parents are saying while thinking about whatever else they want to think about. And all of a sudden, I, I heard this jingle. And it was very subtle. It wasn't very loud. But when I heard it, I looked to my right and I noticed that a spoon 
rose from the dish rack, which you could actually see from the living room, into the kitchen. It rose from the dish rack, levitated in the air for about three seconds, and then projected itself through the living room and hit the window. And I remember it like it happened yesterday. I remember my mother's response. She was not as shocked as I was because she didn't see the spoon rise from the dish rack. She just saw it flying through the air and hit the window. And she assumed that it was one of my siblings or someone ran into the kitchen and did it. And I said, absolutely not. I, 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 I'm <laughs> absolutely clear about what I saw. She later admitted it. And, and to this day, she is still um, very puzzled by it, as am I. But that one experience where gravity you know, was, was, was defied, as, as I understand gravity, uh, really has shaped my perception of the world, I would say, in ways that I'm not fully aware of yet. But I think when you experience something that's so specific, okay, it, it has to place a space in your mind where you want to look for things that are seemingly hidden. Right? This wasn't a very loud occurrence. It wasn't like a bookcase fell down or, or you know, a door slammed open. It was very, very specific. And, you know, I actually, I remember the spoon that flew. It was, it was a spoon that was given to my mother by her favorite uncle, uh, who was a musician, uh, Uncle John. And he had a PhD in music. He played piano and he traveled the world. Uh, playing music with uh, musicians like Della Reese and, and many other musicians, but that was her favorite uncle. And that silverware set was her wedding gift from her uncle. And to this day, I have to imagine uh, that it, it must have been <laughs> maybe the spirit of Uncle John just saying, hey, I'm here. It wasn't aggressive. It wasn't any, it was just, you know, but it was very specific and very direct. And I would say, Having that experience has brought me to a place where I always want to try and find the thing that doesn't quite fit within the works of art or architecture or film or literature that we all know and embrace and love. So when you see the beauty of Le Corbusier layering plans and layering and the, the sense of opaque transparency, right? I mean, there's an otherness to that that you can't really fathom or describe. But when you go to the Met, uh, when it opens again, and you look at that incredible painting by Manet, a portrait of a man as a maho, and with what essentially looks like a relatively normative space in painting, then you look between the arms of the, paint, of, of the figure standing, and you see there's just a passage of pink paint and a passage of blue paint. And they have no logical relationship to the background, to the foreground, to the object. They're just elements of paint that are suspended from the logic of the painting, yet they're there. And you find these elements in many, many great works of art where things are just disengaged from a larger reality. You know, one of the things that I've also found to be very, very important in this question of understanding architecture, understanding art, is that of being an educator, being a teacher. And I've been fortunate enough to have taught close to 3,000 students over a 20-year period of time in art and in architecture um, at the Cooper Union, at Pratt Institute, at Rensselaer, where I currently teach and act as the first year design coordinator, but students hold a special place in my heart because I, <laughs> you can't help but um, be reminded of the power of the future and the beauty of optimism. And there's, there's always another wave of people coming who have so much to offer and so much to give to the world. And as a teacher, I always feel that your job is to teach your students everything you've learned in whatever period of time you have with them. So if you 
have 30 years of knowledge and experience and you have 14 meetings, which is basically what a semester is, right? 14 weeks. You have to teach 30 years of knowledge in 14 weeks. If you get a 10-day residency, right, you're going to absorb every bit of knowledge, right, that everyone has there. And I really believe in that compression of time. And it, it's, it's, it's something that, that has been so important to me. So I, I've often taken the students, you know, on there's a semester where I take them to New York City, you know, for a weekend or, or a day. And we go and we look at architecture. And there's always one or two students who have never been on the subway before. They've never, right? So they get initiated in, in the hardcore New York way. But it's an incredible thing when you get to contribute to the very early part of someone's life. And as much as we may take for granted, works of art, works of architecture that we become familiar with over many decades as educators or as practitioners. You know, this is the first time someone is hearing about Louis Kahn. This is the first time someone is hearing the name Le Corbusier. This is the first time someone is hearing the name Stephen Hall. This is the first time someone is hearing the, right? And you have the honor and pleasure of being that person that introduces them to that name. And I think, the future as an architect, as a painter for me, is to construct buildings, to create more paintings and installations, and to write. I'm currently working on three books about the relationship between painting and architecture. One is called Surface Mining, which is really a kind of studio monograph. Uh, the second one is called Anatomical Apparitions, and it's a theory on the relationship or a set of theories on the relationships between painting and architecture. And it's a series of essays, uh, roughly three time frames, 1900 to 1945, 1945 to 2000 and 2000 to whatever the present will be when the book is out. And then the third book is a book called Twisted Siblings, which is a book of interviews that I've been working on for some time now, which is really coming to uh, its, conclusion very shortly, but it's a series of essays uh, and interviews with architects, artists about the question of painting and architecture. So these are three of the things that I'm working on. In addition to a number of building proposals, uh, self-generated at the moment, some of them, others uh, prompted by opportunities to construct works in the world. And I'm very excited about that. But one thing that's very important to me is to keep a daily practice of drawing, of painting, of reading and writing. And I'm very happy to be here this morning, having the chance to share some of my thoughts with you and share some of the underlying ideas and stories that are in the works. And these are some of the current works that I'm working on. And they're all focused on single colors, monochromatic works where the question has been reduced to that of a single color and a particular way of forming, shaping, or manipulating the surface of the canvas. So that is to say the paint and the canvas, they become the subject matter. And the hope is that you can shape material in such a way that you create certain emotive or psychological states in the viewer, that you tap into certain ways of communicating with people that may go beyond language, that may go beyond specifics, but speak more about um, universal questions of experience as much as there can be universal questions of experience. So these are some of the current works in progress. You know, I just want to maybe lastly speak about time, maybe, in the future. It's 2 million, 127,000 approximately minutes. 89,071 months, approximately. 
give or take a few leap years, 2,928 months. It's 244 years. As of last week, you know, that's how old uh, the United States of America is, which is astounding when you really think about it. It's not even 250 years old. And I like to really think that the country at the moment in its youth, in its youth, is going through something that probably every nation state goes through in its formation, right? Um, origins are often very messy, right? They're never pretty, they're never clean. Um, and we have an origin which is very close to us. I mean, the first photograph was, as we, we tend to accept in art history, constructed in 1826. That means the first photograph is made a couple of decades after the country was formed, right? So more or less, we have documentation of the formation of this country, photographic documentation, filmic documentation, uh, which means the actions, right? The thoughts, the words are captured and they're there. And I think the difficulty that perhaps we're having at the moment is that we're contending with origins. And I think this is something that all groups deal with. I remain very, very optimistic about the United States of America. And this talk is not about that, but I think it would be uh, very difficult not to speak at least to something that's happening in the moment, right outside of one studio. I remain very optimistic about the country. I think it is probably one of the most complex social experiments that has ever existed on the planet. Uh, you have people that come from every single part of the world. For one reason or another, they come here, some stay, some don't. I think that's an incredible thing. And I think it's important that we hear one another. I think it's important that people have the space to communicate, that people have the space to think together and to be together. And the one thing being a teacher really reminds me of is that question of community, a collective community of thoughts, of actions, of people who are brought together by the love of something. In this case, it's architecture, it's art. And this is the future that I will continue to work towards. You know, there was only one uh, school that I applied to when I was young. It wasn't the smartest thing to do in hindsight, but I, I had a plan. And when I was 12 years old, I told my father that I wanted to be a baseball player. I said, I want to replace Don Mattingly because he was the first baseman for the New York Yankees. I said, he has a bad back. Dad. And in a few years, they're going to need a replacement. He says, listen, you, you don't want to go into sports. Uh, you should study architecture. I said, really? OK. He says, a professor of mine, Professor Carmi B, told me about this school, Cooper Union. He says, he went to that school. He was my professor at City College. And he told me that I should apply when I was his student at City College. But I was too old. I was already 30 years old. I had a family. I had a wife. But you should apply. So from the age of 12 until 18, I said, OK, I'm going to prepare to get into Cooper Union. So I, I, I set my mind on that. And, that. and I didn't apply to any other school. And at that time, you would get a home exam in the mail. I imagine it's still quite similar. And I was waiting, 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 waiting for that test. And my father would come home. He was a contractor as well. And he would come home from work very, very late at night. He would always have the mail. And I remember it like it was yesterday. He sat the mail down on the desk and then he gave me a yellow envelope. And he says, oh yeah, this is for you. And it was the home exam from Cooper Union. And I opened the exam. This was March 27th, 1993, when I got it test was stamped a couple days before that and it was sent into the mail and I read the questions and it said to draw a map of your face that was the first question the second was to generate a spatial image
of the literary text of labyrinths by Borges. The third question was to construct a literary passage of a Piranesi print. The fourth was to define a sequence of moments in action. And then the fifth was to design a tomb of Orpheus. So when I looked at the third question, I said, wow, there's an image. And I looked at the bookshelf that we had in the study with the Encyclopedia Britannica. My parents still have that set from 1981. <laughs> and the Micropedia, the last entry on the seventh volume said Piranesi. I didn't know who Piranesi was, but it was on the encyclopedia. And I opened the encyclopedia to the last page and there was Piranesi. And I said to myself, I'm going to get into this school. And I took off from high school for a month. You got a month to work on the exam. I didn't go to school. My parents didn't force me. They just said, you know, don't you think you should apply to other schools? I said, don't, don't worry about it. Don't you think you should go to school? I said, don't worry about it. This was the days when no one came to look for you when you didn't show up. So this is the good old days. Now, of course, it'd be a different story. But I, I remember getting the call saying that I got accepted to the school. And I remember it like it was yesterday. And that forever changed my life. And I, I publicly want to thank all of the wonderful teachers that I had. Uh, in that school because I, they certainly welcomed me into a place that was very, very complex. Uh, with teachers such as Toshiko Mori, Diane Lewis, Sue Gassau, Tony Candido, uh, Richard Henderson, Raymond Abraham. Uh, it was such a long list of amazing people. But I just wanna end with saying thank you to my teachers and thank you to my students. And to end with one image of my dad's Windsor Newton watercolor palette. It's the only thing I have left of his architectural days when he was a student. It's never been used. I haven't used it yet, but maybe one day I'll get a chance. So thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Anthony, thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. Um, fantastic. It, it, um, I feel very moved, uh, to be honest. and. Um, um, I'd like to thank you for bringing us so close to you. Um, ooh, it, 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 it was captivating, Anthony, very, very beautiful. Um, and actually it, it brought to mind the, um, uh, the exhibit we did uh, at the uh, Patras and I got reminded of the title of the work was, Will You Still Be There in the Morning? Um, and it was, a series of, it was an installation, sculptural, more so than a painting, and it was installed uh, in an outdoor space uh, in between like a glass um, um, courtyard in an old building in, in Padres, my hometown. Um, and, and reading or thinking about this title again, Will You Still Be There in the Morning? Uh, it, it takes on this, this whole in a different perspective. Um, and, and it, the, the funny part is that, that you had used some uh, bricks from an old paper factory uh, that, uh, that was in disarray and, and almost collapsing, uh, very hard to maintain in, in this small town. And I remember drafting a letter uh, to this organization saying 400 bricks of the old type, you know, of the small size and the nine pallets of, of the old type were removed from this building and will be returned <laughs> upon <laughs> the show. <Yeah. laughs> it was a beautiful piece, Anthony, and, uh, and yes, the work and the journey that, that, you, that we entered here uh, was fantastic. And um, I, I would like to, um, I also appreciate really very much the, 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 the framework of the optimism uh, it's very much needed, and uh, and and thank you for 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 doing that. Um, I would like to, to. There are questions already uh, mm -hmm. posted at the at the Q and A um, and in the chat, and I would like to open it up um, to our residents and to the the public. So, I, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. Please. Okay. Um, so I think it's, it is a really great presentation. And I kind of like the fact that you took on 
the origin story of yourself to kind of dictate how the work kind of progressed over time. Um, given the situation right now and the current scenario of the world, how do you feel the origin of an individual should translate into work more rather than following a specific trend that's happening in the world right now? Like, do you think individuality and originality should be uh, promoted further and not, um, you know, subdued? Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, that, that is a very, very uh, complex question, but I think it's at the very core of what we all contend with as, as individuals. And, I, you know, I'm of the mindset that, you know, you, you're always in the state of becoming. You know, in other words, if you're actively living in the world, if you're actively engaging and exchanging with people and places and things, you know, you're constantly becoming a person, right? And I think the sense of becoming as opposed to being something is, is far more important. So that is to say, you know, how do you, and if I understand your question correctly, how does one uh, search or explore oneself while remaining in the context of a collective, right? Um, this is, you know, this is a, a critical question. And I would say, you know, a lot of it is, is out of your control to a certain extent. That is to say, uh, for the first maybe 18 years of your life, you know, um, you, know you, you really are the, the, the legal responsibility of your parents, of the state, of the institution, maybe a little older, younger, depending on where you're from or where you live. So much of your life is shaped, um, you know, outside of a lot of your agency before you're a certain age, but certainly you're, you know, one is intelligent enough to be drawn towards things and to be interested in things and to, to, to construct future goals for oneself. But when you enter a certain realm in society, let's say past the age of 18, when you, maybe you attend university or the workplace or more complex social fabrics, um, I think of it as being an exchange, right? In other words, you're, you're learning from others and hopefully others learn from you. So I would say, you know, quiet time is maybe very important. Um, being reflective if possible, it's not always possible. But I would say the time that we're in now, although it's, it, it's obviously very um, um, existentially uh, tense and, and difficult, certainly compels us all to look carefully at ourselves. Uh, we're all gonna see things that we can improve upon. We're all gonna see things that we don't like. And maybe some things that we do like about ourselves and about the people around us. And I think when we have those moments when we can actually consider very carefully what we want our contribution to be to the larger world. We're very lucky. So I would say um, for, for younger people right now, let's say students who are studying, who are in school, who may be unsure about the immediate or the near or distant future, um, you have so much uh, at the moment in terms of the community of people that you're around to really think and to plan very carefully and, and to have rigorous and vigorous exchange with people, right? So I would say it's perhaps less a case of, uh, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I would say perhaps it's less a case of trying to be an original and maybe more a case of trying to understand the influences that you find yourself around and trying to understand the way that you influence other people in other situations and to live within that. And if you're fortunate enough to, let's say, know what you love to do, which in this case is architecture, or it may be art, it may be writing, it may be music, it may be science, you're extremely fortunate because you then have a very particular framework in which to locate your desires, your wishes, your thoughts, your actions. So I would say if you know what you love to do, you're already extremely fortunate. So once you know what you love to do, surround yourself around with people who also love that. So the fact that you're in the residency right now is, is so beautiful. That's the best thing you can be doing with your time because you're with 
five, six, seven other people who are also going on this interesting journey, right? So be open, be open. <laughs> That's what I would say. That was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. People are responding in the chat. Thanking you, Anthony. Yes, thank you. Oh, it was a great talk, uh, beautiful paintings, remembering the charrette, and uh, interesting uh, stream here um, of text. Um, a little bit of nostalgia of the. <laughs> Um, I can take um, I can take questions. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. If there... yeah, sure, I can I can actually see some of them as well. So. Lauren Hankin is asking, is saying great lecture. I'd love to hear more about how you think different environments, architecture affect the viewer's perspective of your work. Mm. Different environments, architecture affect the viewer's. Perception, I, sorry, I misread, I think, perception of your work. Right. Yeah, that's, you know, this is, this is, um, it's a very mysterious thing, you know, how work of any sort is, is perceived. And, you know, if, if a work is unto itself, let's say, a single work in a space, um, there is a certain amount of attention that that work will immediately generate, right? It's like if you have a large field of white and there's a red dot, right? The red dot will immediately <laughs> charge that space. Obviously, the more dots you have and, and, and as the sizes begin to vary, your attention gets pulled in different places. So I would say, um, you know, to use maybe three of the installations that I showed, you know, in, in Ithaca, in Milwaukee, in Chelsea, Manhattan, uh, essentially the same body of work, but completely different reading of the work. I would say in Chelsea, the work probably operated in somewhat of a, of a, a confrontational manner. Right, as I said, there were two grids, which I, I credit uh, Dr. Kumpush always to that uh, installation choice because he saw those paintings uh, with Dr. Olshin in my studio um, months before the exhibition. And he said, ah, the grid, that's how you have to hang them. So, you know, that confrontation, I think, was important in that space. And the space seemed to lend itself to that. If you go to the other end of the spectrum, <clears throat> excuse me, in Ithaca, that space was, I would say, far more differentiated in a sense. It wasn't a single closed box, so to speak, right? It had transparency, it had opacity, it had a pivoting wall. So the sense of how a viewer might be located in place was really imagined beforehand. And I really tried to locate the work strategically, almost like uh, constellations in the space so that you would never be focused on a single work without being aware of another work in another part of the gallery. So different spaces certainly do change one's perception of, of a work. And I think as, an, as a painter, uh, painters, I, I would say often, and this is a generalization, but painters probably, you know, see the wall and, you know, you put nails in a wall and, or, whatever you use to hang a painting and and that's pretty much it maybe you fiddle with the lighting a bit uh to keep the shadows out or create shadows if you want but i think this question of spatial orchestration and movement through a space is not often considered as part of the project but i often consider it uh there's a there's another question from thank you for that question uh there's another question melon metal Melanie uh, Redrick, uh, uh, let's see, on slide 55, I'll have to remember what slide 55 was. Okay, let's see here. In the meantime, Patrick Queen, Queen is saying, not a question, but a comment that he's learned more about you today than he knew from all your meetings and luncheons. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you. I feel the same. <laughs> Yes, thank, thank you, Patrick Quinn, uh, wonderful colleague and um, 
elder and mentor, um, the dean of, of Rensselaer at one point, and you know, we've um, sparked an incredible friendship and dialogue over, over the years. So I, it's so happy that he had a chance. I see, I see Patrick is, ra is raising his hand. I can try to um, allow to talk, if I can do that quickly, wh while you're looking for that slide, Anthony. Yes, right. Uh, the city. I think uh, that someone is asking about one of the images in one of the slides. I think, uh, yeah, the image that you're asking about, Melanie, it's actually a still from the film Marathon Man by John Schlesinger, starring Laurence Olivier and um, Dustin Hoffman. Uh, long story behind the slide, but I'd be happy at some other point to go into it. Yeah, but it's not a it's not a cityscape. It's actually a, a a desk with a book being moved by a flashlight. So if you get to watch that film again, watch that that it's an incredibly subtle but very mysterious occurrence in that film that would otherwise go unnoticed. But again, flying spoons maybe make you look for things like that. Interesting, and. Um... Patrick, do you think you, um, I see you raising your hand, perhaps we can hear you, I think, if you unmute. If you unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we can. But you can't see me. No. Oh, I don't know why. It's okay. <laughs> Anthony, a simple question. The most uh, dramatic images you presented were of the three chairs and the levitating spoon. Mm. And the fact that you remember so vividly from the time when you were two years old leads me to ask a question because my earliest memories of experiencing space and color and light and form were when I was between one and two years old. Have you ever asked yourself or others the question, do creative people remember things from their, almost their birth, almost the womb, more vividly than those who choose not to spend their life in creative things? Well, the tempting answer would be to say yes. <laughs> but uh, of course, you know, I, I, that, well, that would be an interesting, it'd be interesting to ask those who we deem to be creative if, if they tend to have very very long and deep memories and it's it's likely that many do but i would suspect that there may be many many people that have deep and early memories you know you know memory is so mysterious because you know we've all experienced that group meeting when you when you meet with a group of friends that you may have a long history with and there's always that person, they bring up some obscure event or something that happened and then, and then everybody would say, my God, you have such a good memory. Now, clearly others would have to have access to that memory as well or else they would not be able to verify that this particular person has such a good memory, right? So- But it's a visual memory we're talking about. Well, I, Gee, I, I only think of memory as being visual. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's a, I, I never thought of memory as being anything other. Um, that's, I, I don't have an answer to that question, but I, I, I would like to think many people have memories and there's no way in which to understand how or why we remember certain things. I mean, I'm sure everyone has a very random memory of some occurrence at some table with their grandmother or their cousin when they were three years old, for some reason. It's nothing out of the ordinary, nothing particular. It's just a memory that lingers. I mean, we all know um, people who uh, sometimes begin to, let's say, lose memory at a certain point, yet they tend to remember very specific things very well. And there's very little understanding as to why. So to answer your question, I think it, the, the question of memory is, is a very mysterious one. I think perhaps visual artists maybe tend to remember things more visually, but perhaps musicians tend to remember sound more. And, 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 and writers, maybe they tend to remember words. 
or conversations better? That's an excellent question. I'll keep thinking about it. I don't know. Topic of our next luncheon, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Patrick. Welcome. There is a follow-up about memory from Kieran Waters. Um, it, whether it engages all senses, whether it's just it depends on the person's strength. And um, we had uh, the neuroscientist uh, Leah Kelly with us uh, on Monday, and she spoke uh, to us about memory and how, in fact, complex um, the whole understanding is. But um, uh, it's certainly spatial that I carried away from her uh, discussion. Um, Anthony, there is um, additional questions in both the Q&A and the chat, uh, so um, feel free to, to navigate. Uh, there's a question from Christopher. Uh, thank you, Christopher. Uh, how do you approach teaching an architect how to use storytelling when giving shape to form, and would you have an example? That's a, that's a question. Well, to tell stories, I mean, that that is... Uh, what does it mean to tell a story? You know, there, there is one story that you can tell, uh, but you can also try and tell the stories of others. I mean, I think one classic example that many architects and architectural students and, and educators is, are familiar with is the, you know, giving, uh, let's say, uh, Invisible Cities by Calvino as, as a text of inspiration or something by Borges, for instance, like Labyrinths and many other examples. Uh, you know, literary works that are, are very visual in nature, quite descriptive, that might spark spatial, spatial movements, spatial uh, actions. Um, I don't have a particular way of, of teaching students to create form through storytelling, but I do try and encourage every student to understand that they are a very complex being and they may not understand why they are drawn towards certain things, certain colors, textures, materials, shapes, forms, perhaps they'll never know. But I always try and ask a student to trust their intuition and then to test that intuition rigorously over long periods of critique. So I think stories in a sense maybe emerge over time. You know, perhaps it's only in hindsight that one can really create a story and see one's work as part of a story, um, particularly when you're dealing with, with, with younger people because, you know, at the age of 18, which is the average age of students that I deal with, I have graduate students also, but, you know, much of your life is, is, is presumably ahead of you at the age of 18, right? So by the time you're 36, you have another 18 years <laughs> of experience, i.e. stories to, to draw from. And, and obviously, as you, you grow in age, uh, the, the amount of time increases that you have, and you have greater access to stories. So I don't have a particular way, but I ask students to be mindful of who they are and to be open and to allow their thoughts to flow, but to be very critical in a productive manner. So if you make a drawing, let the drawing come out, but then sit with the drawing and look at it very carefully in silence for as long as you can and ask yourself what it may be telling you because stories uh, have very interesting ways of getting out uh, and it doesn't always come out through uh, the mouth, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> Since you're talking about the, the drawings, Dimitra Tsahreli is also asking a question about um, if you can uh, speak a little bit about how your work um, or how you see through your work uh, the ephemeral or certain time qualities expressed in the, in the drawings. So how, the, sorry, yeah. the ephemeral nature or the transformation of time, for me it's more the canvas is is transforming. I mean, there is a sense of time that um, I would agree is is quite obvious. Um, it comes out to you when you when you look at your work. Would you like to talk a little bit more about that? Time, ephemerality. Uh, well, I, you know, I, I was having a, a conversation the other day with um, with. A friend and and we were sort of laughing about uh, 
certain pretentious ways of, of talking about one's work and says, you know, maybe the medium is not latex on canvas. Maybe it's gravity and air. <laughs> uh, type of stuff you, you embarrassingly allow yourself to do on a Sunday afternoon. But I think there, you know, for me, there is something very important about trying to use painting and architecture as a medium of, of capturing time. I don't have a better way to say it than that, but allowing process to be made visible. So uh, if, if one were to engage a work or a painting of mine, and I know many other painters, it's very important that there are traces of how the work is made, right? Clues of how it's made. There are many painters who obviously are not interested in that. They, you know, they, they would value perhaps a more mechanistic approach where you can't necessarily read the steps or the process. But for me, it's, it's, it's very important to allow mistakes, allow for mistakes, to allow for discoveries. And, you know, I find, interestingly enough, when I look at a drawing or I look at a painting or I, I almost always remember where I was when I did it. You know, maybe that's a story I'm telling myself after the fact, but when I look at a painting, I can look at parts of it and I say, I remember the exact moment when I did that. I, I remember at least the feeling or the thought, like, yeah, that's right. Or, oh God, why would you do that, Anthony? That makes no sense, you ruined it, right? But I remember those things. So I, 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 I very much see the act of making painting as, as being conscious of time. And the artifact that we call a painting, I would say, is maybe a trace of time. I mean, you can say that of all objects, perhaps, but as I've said earlier, I think, the sense of leaving the trace, how material flows, the way gravity plays is, is, is important. So for me, I see painting as a way of capturing a certain degree of, of, of ephemerality and time that moves by. I love the material made by gravity and time. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was very nice. There's a, there's a question by uh, Damon Rock, Damon Rich. Uh, let's see, how, how do you explain the role of craft, the role in craft of abstraction? Do you share faith with Mondrian in its world-changing potentials? Does it have politics? How does the work and effect of abstraction differ between painting and architecture? Okay. Uh, okay, three questions. Uh, does it have politics? I, well, you know, perhaps if, if you would have to define politics, um, I mean, as, as I see it, I think we, as individuals, we live in the world and we are you know, put in front of or in forces and dynamics that are, let's say, outside of our immediate agency. They can be natural forces, social forces, economic forces. And, you know, perhaps these together make political forces, right? So how do you act within that, right? Uh, so if you're, if you're an artist in general, a painter in particular, and an abstract painter in particular, uh, I guess one can be seen as turning away from the world, turning away from um, the moment outside of oneself. I think that's perhaps uh, the way that abstraction often gets perceived. Um, I, I see painting as, as an act of concentration and reflection. And my hope is that you become a more aware, intelligent, and compassionate person by focusing on acts of concentration. So if I were a writer or a musician, I would perhaps like to think that the composing of music, the arrangement of sound over time, as Stravinsky said, right, 
does something to one's perception of the world that then allows you to act in a more compassionate way, right? That allows you to act in a more sensitive way. So I don't know if, if you know, I don't see the object of painting, quote unquote, meaning the object, the thing to necessarily be political in the way you may, you may be defining political, but I certainly see the act of creativity as a way of concentrating the mind and making one more sensitive and we hope more sensitive towards things that would better us all. Um, how does abstraction and painting, how does abstraction and painting differ than abstraction and architecture? Uh, I, that's an, a, a very complex question as well, but I would say in a nutshell, um, you know, painting, has at least the pretense of being removed from use in the way that architecture is. So if one can define abstraction as a form of removed, concentrated distillation, architecture, comparatively speaking, you know, is a more grounded space of active engagement. And that's its very power and beauty. Um, I think both are incredibly effective, but I think they, they serve or satisfy different necessities in society and clearly can have linkages as we see the long history of painting and architecture. And I think hopefully my book opens some questions about that, but uh, I think maybe they serve different roles. They, they play a different role in how we think and, and perceive the world. Thank you. As a New Yorker that lived in difficult, lived in a difficult time in its city, how did you see architecture help to heal social problems? Maybe this is, uh, I don't know if there's another one, but maybe this is one to maybe um, conclude with because I know we're, we're moving into um, our other space. But um, I think architecture is one of the highest forms of being. I won't say the highest form because it will offend people who <laughs> are not architects, but uh, I, I would say it is maybe the highest form of, of being. And when I say architecture, I, I don't just mean the built environment. I mean architecture as a way of understanding, seeing and acting in the world. That is to say, the bringing together, the framing of different forces. Those forces may be material, the forces may be social, it may be temporal, but the, the co-mingling of many, many different layers, I think is, is, is the key. And I would say architecture at its best, um, it, 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 I mean, if you see, a, if you have the great pleasure and fortune in life of being in the presence of a great work of architecture, it, it changes, it, it, it's, you know, I always have, you know, the last anecdote, I was having a conversation, uh, Dr. Kumpush and I, I think uh, last weekend, and, you know, I, I said to him, you know, I was reading um, passages in kindergarten chats by Louis, Louis Sullivan, and I was saying to him, you know, whenever I go to Bleecker Street, and I see that building that Louis Sullivan designed. Small humble compared to much of his work in Chicago and in the Midwest. But whenever I see that building and I look up at the cornice and you see the beauty of someone's mind at work, it changes one's, one's mood, it changes your being. I, I don't know how else to say it. And I would, I would argue the same if you experience a great painting, a great piece of music, a great work of literature, uh, it changes your, it, it opens something up in you. And I think the great challenge is to keep that space of, of otherness open. And I, I would like to think schools and places where people come together to exchange thoughts and ideas help to keep those spaces open. So uh, I 
am so uh, fortunate that so many people came and shared their thoughts today and that I was invited by T-Space to give this talk and share some thoughts. So I really appreciate uh, everyone's time and we went over a little bit, but uh, I hope this was useful and um, yes, certainly. a little light to, to what we're all going through. Thank you all so much. Thank you very, very much. Thank Anne. you. Is, Thank you. Yeah, I Thank certainly you. don't want to interrupt that there are still questions out there we'll share with you uh, later. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much.